Hi, I'm Bob Balch. Thanks for tuning in to my That's Jesus channel. I am uh, a little bit nervous, to be honest with you. Today is the day that I'm going to be sharing my testimony with you. Um, if you have any children in the area, you might want to ask them to leave. If you are under 18, um, you probably shouldn't watch this either as things are going to be getting a little bit explicit, and this is a, uh, a Bible-based, uh, Christian-based YouTube channel, even though that's the case. I'm going to, my testimony is a, a little bit graphic. So uh, with that being the case, I'd like to just pray real fast, if you don't mind, and uh, we'll go on ahead and, and get into this. Lord, I just thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity to be rich in your favor, the opportunity to um, share my testimony with people who um, may be able to use it to strengthen their relationship with you. When it's all said and done, Father, being in a relationship with you is what life is all about. And so if this helps them do that, Lord, I surrender everything to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, in my Bible, Romans 7.14 falls under the heading of uh, the conflict of two natures. Now, that's, that's a pretty accurate view of that section of Scripture, and it's a perfect description of me for almost 40 years. I was a sex addict. For more than half my life before I was delivered from that bondage, um, that sinful existence. And this is my journey to escape that body of death that I was um, carrying around because of my own choices. This is uh, going to be a little bit difficult as I, as I go through this, so bear with me if I pause, if there are some cuts and edits in the video. Um, just, just know that, uh, this is difficult for me to talk about. I was, I was molested when I was very young between the first and third grade, uh, an older boy, um, really a young man would occasionally, um, have me in his home. And once there, his grandparents would send us to his room until, um, the evening, uh, or early afternoon, and typically within an hour or so, he would take me to his closet, and the molestation would happen. Um, I did not complain. I did not run. I did not cry. I just let him do what he wanted because he made me feel like I was special, and I wanted to be special. Um now, I'm not saying that I didn't feel special at home. Uh, my older sisters would let me be with them if, if, uh, if I wanted to. If they, they would sometimes allow me to play with my G.I. Joes while they played with their Barbies. And I was the youngest child and the only boy in our family until about the third grade. And I really enjoyed life for the most part. In spite of the occasional sexual abuse by that young man, I was really happy. Uh, my mother put me in Cub Scouts. My dad was uh, able to sometimes watch me play my first season of baseball. But really all that kind of ended when my parents decided to have another baby. At first, I was excited about that. And then everything changed during my mom's pregnancy. My room was uh, not turned into a nursery. Um Instead, my brother would be in my parents' room, a room that uh, other kids in the family, my sisters and I, were forbidden to enter. But that's where he was going to be staying. Um, when he was born, my parents' lives uh, started anew with this child that they had actually planned and prepared for in every way. And to a nine-year-old boy, though, to me, it was really the end of the world. Now, I, I love my brother, um, but I'm just being honest about, about how I felt at the time. Um, 
soon after my brother's birth, the, my family moved uh, several hours away. It was the summer, the summer after my third grade year. Um, it was a new city, a new school, a new home, a new church, new friends, a new life, really. And uh, but grief and sorrow really gripped me. I did not realize that that's what was happening at the time. All I knew is that my parents were suddenly not as interested in me and my life anymore. And uh, things I used to get punished for, for were really acceptable for my brother to do them if he did those things. And um, things that I, I did during and after school um, really weren't attended much by my parents. And uh, things that I was proud of seemed to be ignored. Um, even rebellious things that I did um, for attention barely raised an eyebrow a lot of the times. Um, that's probably because I was uh, raised in a really good home and, and, and I was a good kid and I didn't get in trouble a lot. And so my parents probably gave me a lot of grace and a lot of trust. Um, but at the time, I just wanted my parents. And um, I, that's just the, the way it was. My best friend in the world um, was... Uh, still in in the city where uh, I spent my my really early days uh, up to the through the third grade, and um, that was really hard for me. So I was hurting and I craved comfort. So I I chose to self medicate in the only way that I knew how at the time, which was basically the way that I was shown by that young man. Um, I made myself feel better. By, um, by stimulating my body in, in uh, sexual ways. So starting about the third grade, uh, any ta- anytime I felt stress or, or anger or, or sadness or jealousy or fear, um, anytime I felt guilt, uh, loneliness, especially loneliness, uh, boredom, I, I would engage in those acts that relieved uh, me that released this surge of hormones into my brain, and um, those those hormones uh, like dopamine and oxytocin and and serotonin, um, they would immediately cause me to feel better. That that rush of calm, that rush of relaxation and peace and happiness, and the feelings of contentment would last a while, and uh, but predictably the feelings. Well, they they were only temporary, right? And um, predictably as well, the the stimulus required to obtain those hormones had to increase in frequency or, what's the word? I I guess uh, increase in depravity to get a satisfactory and acceptable amount of rush in pleasure. It It was really a downward spiral of addiction and addictive behavior that really had only one end in sight, and that end was hell. Um, And that started about the third grade, honestly. Maybe I was just an early bloomer. I don't know. Uh, When we moved and I was in the fourth grade, the fifth grade, sixth grade, things just got more and more and more um, depraved. I was able to get my hands on pornography easily, uh, hiding it in my room, um, able to in- engage in activities with others as well. And um, that just, uh, that was my norm. It, it was how I self-medicated, I guess. And interestingly, I, I kept up that a charade of having this very religious um, image that I was able to, able to portray to others, um, all the way through and and in, and in, into my uh, teenage years and adult life, uh, throughout my life, uh, public schools, um, marriages one, two, and three. I've been married multiple times. Uh, the military, going to college. 
uh, career changes. I actually had a church life in the eyes of the world. Um, sometimes my attendance was uh, sparse and inconsistent, uh, but it was certainly more frequent than most people. Um, however, most of the time, and for years at a time, actually, I was uh, in the church building every instance that the doors opened. Um, but in spite of that, a pattern developed. Now, this, this pattern was simple once I was out of my teenage years. Um, I would remain faithful to my spouse but by not having any type of physical contact with anyone else. However, I would look at or read uh, pornography whenever the opportunity presented itself. And I made sure that it presented itself almost every single day, several times a day. Now, of course, the feelings of guilt and shame would come crashing down as soon as the thrill subsided. And, and I would um, throw magazines away or videotapes away or as technology increased, I would delete files and clear history and purge the cache. And, and, and I would vow that I would never do those things again. But I did do it again every single time. And most of the time within 24 hours. Most of the time within 12 hours. Um, now, like I said, I, I was married several times. And uh, when I was not married... When I when I was when I was not married, my life was a sewage pit of depravity that really does not merit any more than this one sentence. Um, like like a lot of addicts say, quitting is easy. I did it a million times. Staying quit is a different story. Um, I, I would try so frequently and, and so intently to, to stop this addiction. Sometimes, though, I, I would last only a few hours. At other times, it would be a day or two. On some rare, rare occasions, it was more than a week. Um, and in my 39 years, I think I counted it up, 39 years of addiction, I think I remained sexually sober for over a month, once, maybe twice. And I, I tried really hard to be the epitome of what a Christian life was supposed to be. And... In so many ways, with the exception of my sexual addiction, um, my Christian life was good. I, I, I prayed publicly and privately. I studied. I worshipped. I, I, I would lead the, the church in, in music by singing. I, I gave. I, I ministered. I taught. I, uh, I sometimes counseled. I presented the gospel. I urged others to turn their life over to Jesus. I told people that the Lord would deliver them from their sin and their temptation because he always offered a route of escape, right? I even preached to the entire church on, on occasion. But still at night, when the lights were out behind a closed door with the curtains closed and the ceiling fanned off to ensure that I heard whether someone was approaching I sinned. No matter how much I did not want to, I could not stop doing it. No matter, no matter how celibate I wanted to be for God, I could not achieve it. In my years that I was married, that was the typical, that was the typical cycle. When I was not married, I would go places, I would do things with people that I didn't even know. 
don't know their names, too many to count. And it's, it's a shameful thing. It's a shameful thing, and it's what sexual addiction is. And so um, it seemed like my faith just didn't work. I mean, I, I cried out to the Lord with tears and weeping. I, I begged for deliverance. My Bible was full of, of notes and highlights. I, I, I prayed and I prayed for strength as I, I studied and I read and I learned and I searched Scripture. I asked Jesus to remove these cravings. I would implore my Savior. I, I, would, I would beg my King to deliver me. I, I repented in no uncertain terms. I, I swore allegiance to the creator of the universe, and I promised to lean solely on him. And I, I beseeched the Holy Spirit to, to well up inside of me and, and expel these demonic desires. I, I would feel resolve and peace for a certain amount of time. And then, knowing that the Father had cured my evil heart, knowing that Jesus had saved my soul from wickedness, knowing that the, the Holy Spirit had, had renewed my immoral mind, within hours, the temptations would come. My stomach would turn to knots. My teeth would literally chatter. My, my, my thoughts would fog. My hands would shake. My body would hurt. And my flesh would not submit to my mental demands of self-control. My bones would ignore my orders to steer clear of the computer. It's what it felt like. My, my fingers would not listen to my instructions to avoid the keyboard. And then I would just hop off that wagon and I would set it on fire. And my body would take over while my brain just anxiously awaited its next dose of dopamine. As, uh, as Paul wrote in Romans 7, uh, verses 14 through 24, I was a slave to sin. The activity that I wanted to never be involved in again was the same thing that had its grips in me and would not let me go. Likewise, every attempt that I had to 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 live a life that was rooted in purity and morality ended in failure and disappointment. What a wretched man I was. Even, even as I was studying my Bible or talking to someone about Jesus, I knew that when I was by myself, when I was alone, or while I was single, as soon as I had the coast clear, to go somewhere. That impulse would appear and I could either face a sleepless night of torment and withdraw or I could give in. I could go to the computer or I could go to the uh, to the business that specialized in taking care of those types of things. And I would relinquish my morality. Paul knew how to, Paul knew exactly, I don't know how, but Paul knew exactly how to describe the circumstances of my life. I know this quote, and you probably, probably do too. My flesh was, quote, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. 
Now my uh, my third marriage ended after about eight years. Um, like my previous two marriages, she um, and I split up. Um, in that divorce, um, it really rocked me, though, because during our second year of marriage, she had an injury that made sexual intimacy very painful for her. And uh, I really cannot lay the blame at her feet at all. I mean, it wasn't her fault. And although I, I tried and I tried to remain celibate with my wife because she was celibate, I, um, the same as I did with my previous two marriages, I, I utilized pictures and videos um, to fuel my sinful habit in a completely disgusting way. I, 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 I was actually proud that I never went beyond a computer screen to satisfy my lust. Isn't, isn't that sick? Oh, I, I still thought about my evil plans throughout the day. But I actually gave myself credit for not being as awful as some other men might have been. I didn't seek pleasure in the arms of someone else. But I had forgotten that those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Regardless of whether anyone else was aware of the filth in which I lived, the desires of the flesh ruled my life. They did. After that divorce, um, I was single again. My three marriages had resulted in three ex-wives, and I had a grand total of 24 years of being a husband and I had a grand total of 24 years of being able to keep the darkness of my addiction hidden from my wives. In fact, I had actually been able to look like the morally upright person in the divorce. I, uh, it was a sick twist that I looked like I was in the right even though I was involved in sexual perversion with pornography. It was a disgusting irony. Um, in, the, in the eyes of, of family and friends, uh, both inside and outside the church, I was the innocent victim, right? But I knew the truth. I knew the truth. While I had been innocent of falling in love with someone and I had been innocent of having an affair as my spouse sat at home waiting, I was the perpetrator of so much more. The standard that Jesus established on the side of a mountain in Matthew 5 made me guilty, guilty of adultery tens of thousands of times simply by lusting after another woman. I knew that, and the shame overwhelmed me. I, I could not put on the facade anymore. So, I, uh, after my third divorce, I put down my faith, and I decided to stop acting like something I wasn't. I decided to stop acting like I followed Jesus when I had not completely surrendered my life to him. I was not successful in that. So no more prayer, no more Bible, no more church, no more, no more hypocrisy is what I thought. 
but um, eventually, eventually love was in my life again. And I did not want to be in love because I really was prepared to be single until I died. But that's not what happened. She was uh, simply an acquaintance of mine. She was barely a friend of mine. Uh, this lady wasn't even my type. Our Christian backgrounds were on opp- opposite ends of the spectrum. Yet a woman that I had known for years and, and in whom I had absolutely no interest, and who had no interest in me, by the way, became the most important human being in my life. We were married in 2012. It was my fourth marriage, and it was her first marriage. And I tried to do everything right and and make it perfect for her. The the marriage, I I wanted it all to be done right, And, and it was done right. It was perfect. And within a few years, we decided to find a church home because I had rejected um, going to church for several years. My wife and I were teachers, and we would travel uh, in the summer and uh, over Christmas break and spring break and, and things like that. And we would listen to sermons, and we would listen to books, and we would listen to religious things, because we were trying to serve the Lord. Now, we had a church home, and um, we were going every time the doors opened, and and I I think I appeared to be pretty religious to those people. And, um, but we had decided that eventually we wanted to become missionaries because we had seriously devoted our lives to serving the Lord, even though I had this secret. And two of our good friends had decided to sell everything they had and move to a foreign country where they could share the gospel with Muslims. And we talked to them, and they had some great advice for us. One of the things that they said was, you need to ask God to expose anything and everything in your life that will prevent you from serving Him completely. And so that really hit me like a punch to the stomach. So my wife and I had been attending this church since, I think, about 2014. But in early 2016, there was a series of sermons that changed my life. And the title was Little White Lies. And that series of sermons convicted me because I was doing what I had done in my other marriages. I was waiting until it was late, and then I would go onto the computer and I would engage in activities I shouldn't engage in. And so with that conviction in my heart, I knew I had to do something. And so in February of 2016, I confessed to my wife that I had been regularly looking at pornography during our marriage. And I then then told her everything. And I held nothing back. For the first time in my life, I had no secrets. 
And she bawled her eyes out because I had hurt her so much. But she also said that she would stand by me if I finally addressed this problem. So I used an online resource that was steeped in a Bible study and reflection, and I progressed. I um, went from white-knuckling my way through uh, withdrawal of regular doses of dopamine to, to learning how to recognize triggers, to, to journaling my way through self-reflection. And I moved forward in this study. Um, one day of celibacy turned into a week, and a week advanced into a month. And, and after a few months of sobriety, I thought that at some point the cravings were going to go away, right? But they did not. Those cravings did not go away. I had taken a break from this online recovery program because some of the memories and the feelings of my youth that it had me analyze were just really too uncomfortable for me to dwell on. But but I knew deep down that I had to face those moments of pain if I wanted real freedom. So the, the moment of truth finally came after an exercise that had me recall all of the instances in my life, especially my youth, when I was most proud. I had to write these down my greatest accomplishments. So I did. I, I wrote and I reflected and I recalled and I, I recounted and I journaled and, and I wasn't sure where this exercise was leading me, where it was going, but I was going to make sure that I excelled in having more things written down than your average addict, right? And then I turned the page and I read the next step and I was prompted to write down the names of all of the important people in my life who were there with me at the times that I was the most proud. And then, and then my heart broke. And my eyes filled with tears as I realized that my parents were hardly ever there. Sporting events, uh, school accomplishments, uh, church camp, graduations, promotions. M my parents were just absent from most of those things when I was young. N not every time. I, I don't have bad parents. I didn't have bad parents. But it was enough times to know that on their priority list of things to do, things that they had to do, my accomplishments weren't at the top of that list. And with the with that that exercise completed the main root of my problem had been discovered. And this is, this, is, this is what it is. Most of my entire life had been spent grieving. And this sounds selfish too, because I, but th this, is, this is just what I realized. I had spent grieving that my brother was more important than me. He wasn't, right? But that's, that's how I felt. For decades, I, I had been full of sorrow over the perception that my achievements were not good enough to make my dad proud of me. I, I went ahead and, and I, I, I continued through the program and I finished the program. And in the end, I had two conclusions. First, that my life had 
been spent self-medicating with sexual acts because I was avoiding the discomfort of not feeling like I was special, um, especially special to my parents. And if I had to pick one, it would be my dad. Um, second, what this is the, the prime thing that I learned. Whatever role my parents had failed in, through, through no fault of their own, they, they didn't try to ignore me. I, I, I don't want you to think that I had bad parents. I have wonderful parents. But whatever role they didn't live up to what I wanted them to, whatever role they failed in, God did not. God never missed a ball game. My Father in heaven always cheered me on. The creator of everything chose to make me. I was never his little surprise. He wanted me. He had plans for me. He desired for me to spend eternity with him. And he still does. To put it simply, out of all of the billions of people on this planet, I, Bob Balch, I am God's very top priority. Now, I don't know how that's possible because you people listening to this video and watching this video, you're his top priority too. So I don't know how that works. I don't know how that's possible. I don't know. But I absolutely do know that it's true. Now, how do I know that that's true? I know because God intentionally chose to make me his son. God chose to adopt me. Romans 8, 15 and 16 say, The Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And uh, just like that, knowing that, knowing that, most of the cravings were gone. Most of them. The yearnings for comfort ceased. Every desire was um, able to be controlled. I am now a slave to Jesus instead of a slave to lust. And I have remained sober by the grace of God since the middle of February 2016. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your forgiveness, for your patience, and for your long-suffering. On my darkest days, God did not turn away from me in shame. On my darkest days, God wept because he knew how badly I hurt. And when I thought that I was all alone, God was there. I just didn't know it. So that's my story. That's my testimony of uh, being freed from sexual addiction. Sexual sobriety is now the norm for me. And when that came, my life changed. 
my wife and I have grown closer in ways that I cannot put into words. And we decided that we were going to let God control our lives in whatever way He wanted. We promised God and promised each other that we would trust the Lord in whatever way He wanted to lead us. The only caveat was this. Whatever God wanted us to do, whatever door He opened, we would absolutely walk through that door, no matter what it was. And we knew that we could do that. We still know that we can do that because we have asked God and believe that He has. We have asked God to close every door that He does not want us to walk through. And so as we're walking through life, I really don't get a lot of opportunities because I've asked God, please don't open any doors unless it is specifically the one you want me to walk through. But I'll tell you this, if God gives me an opportunity to do something, I walk through the door. That's the relationship that we have. And it is liberating to rely solely on God. Since 2016, I have a new career. I live in a new city. I have new friends. My wife is involved in things that I never thought that she would be involved in to minister to people who need the Lord. And we know that the future has more things in store for us. And I'm grateful for it. And that can be your life too. If you're struggling in some way, there are resources available for you. But I do have a word of warning. Satan and his minions love the darkness. And secrets are the foundation of darkness. If you're struggling with a secret sin, you need to confess to somebody, somebody that you can be accountable to, and you need to do it soon. Thank you for watching this video. Thank you so much. If you have a comment, leave a comment. I would appreciate it if you gave it a thumbs up. Uh, I would also appreciate if you subscribe to the channel, you hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so you'll be notified of the next video that comes out. You can share this video if you'd like. God bless you. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Have a great day.